Hello there. Hi. Nice All to right. meet you, Dr. Swanson. I'm Eleanor. Nice to meet you. Let me move my my. There we go. Awesome. How's your day going? So far, so good. That's good. Nice I'm steady like... pace. How's yours? Oh, it's been good. Can't complain. Just cleaning my camera. It's like right yeah. where my I lift my laptop each day, you know? <laughs> it gets a little blurry. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, days go. So we'll we'll start admitting people and then we'll give it a few minutes and then we'll I'll introduce you, okay? Great. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining our pepper rounds today. I'm just gonna give it another minute or two and then we'll introduce Dr. Swanson. Hi, Dr. Wolf. Hey, good to see you again, Cleve. You too. Thank you for joining us. Okay, well, it's officially 12.03, which is my official start time for the pepper rounds. Thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited to have uh, Clayton Swanson with us here today. Uh, Dr. Swanson is a research assistant professor within the Department of Neurology at the University of Florida and a research health scientist with the Brain Rehabilitation Research Center at the Malcolm Randall VA Medical Center. Clayton's training and research spans the domains of motor control, neuromechanics, and neurophysiology. His primary area of interest is both mechanistic and translational. Mechanistically, he focuses on understanding the neural mechanisms of complex dynamic movements, such as turning while walking. Translationally, his research interest is in optimizing the neural control of complex movements to maximize neuroplasticity for enhancing mobility in populations demonstrating deficits, such as older adults and people with neurological injury. Clayton completed his PhD in 21 at, at, at Colorado State University and moved to Gainesville, where he completed a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Dave Clark. Since moving to Gainesville, he's, he's acquired career development funding through the University of Florida Pepper Center and the VA. As a junior investigator, he has worked to develop measurement approaches to assess the cortical control of dynamic walking movements using wireless inertial sensors, transcranial and magnetic stimulation, MRI, and EMG. Overall, his goal is to perform research that helps inform clinical care while meeting the needs of patients who demonstrate mobility disability. All right, we're so excited to hear from you, so I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. I think you guys can now see my screen, so... Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to to discuss some of my research. This is really wonderful. Um, so I'm going to pull this over so I can actually see things. So give me one second so I can. There we go. Um, yeah, so thank you again for the opportunity. Um, today I'm going to talk about investigating age-related uh, neural underpinnings of mobility disability and future directions for targeted prehabilitation interventions, um, something that I'm, I'm really interested in and what I've uh, kind of directed my, my PEPPER uh, project towards. Uh, so of course it's no aging that the, the population that we live in is getting older. And as a, as a factor of age, we, we start to see uh, individuals uh, experience more falls. Uh, so one in three older adults experience a, a, a fall each year. And falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries in people over the age of 65 in the US. And in 2020, the direct medical cost of fatal and non-fatal falls equaled $50 billion in the United States. And that's not a number that is like 
gradually going down. Unfortunately, it's, it's continuing to rise. Um, and so what is causing people to fall? And so a lot of my research is really focused on mobility. So what is mobility? Optimal mo mobility can be defined as the relative ease and freedom of movement in all of its forms, and it's central to healthy aging. Uh, mobility is a significant consideration for research, practice, and policy in aging and public health, as we all know. Um, and if you look at the background of this, this image, right, we can see that there's a lot of different types of mobility going on, right? There's people doing Tai Chi up in the corner. There's people walking their dog, taking their kids out. Um, and so mobility and in, in, in really just exploring our environment is one way and one lens that we can, we can measure uh, the freedom of movement or mobility. But my research has really been focused on the individual. So understanding the kind of the spatial temporal measures of, of walking and balancing and transitions um, in order to, to really characterize uh, how uh, people in, in one group may be moving differently than uh, people in a different group. Um, and so that <clears throat> has led to some work that I um, have, have done, which is trying to understand um, you know, what characteristics of, of movement really discriminate between different populations of people. There's been a whole lot of research looking at uh, the differences between uh, neurotypical young adults and older adults. And of course that, you know, tells us a lot. It tells us that younger people move very differently than older people in some ways, and they move similarly in others. But there's a lot of research that, and the gap of research in terms of looking at the those who are in the middle aged years um, and our older adult population as well. And so I spent uh, some time really trying to understand what are the what are the differences between middle aged uh, adults and older adults because uh, I would guess that there are some some differences between um, younger adults and older adults and also. Are any of these mobility measures able to discriminate people into specific groups? So are there certain um, uh, types of characteristics that really tell us what type of movement um, or what age to bracket that movement really belongs in? And so to do this, we used wireless inertial sensors to get a really strong objective measure of movement. And we recruited um, 20 young adults, 20 middle-aged adults, and 20 older adults, and had them perform static balance tasks, straight ahead walking movements, turning while walking, turning in place, and then had them do some transition. So uh, you can think of a transition as a sit to stand. But before I get into those results, I kind of go into, you know, what are the what are the changes that we see with age in terms of you know, our balance system? So on the right, there's this kind of a graphic. Um, on the y-axis, it would be the reliance of a specific balance system that we use. And then on the x would be the lifespan, so infant, adult, and, and senior, older, adult. Um, and balance is composed of primarily three things. Our vestibular system, which we have a, a relatively um, small reliance over the course of our lifespan. It tells us where we are in relation to gravity, uh, which is, of course, very important. Um, but we also utilize our visual system quite a bit, especially as, you know, an infant and as an older adult. Um, we, we must use our visual system to maintain our postural stability, um, though, you know, as, through the adult years, um, we really don't need to rely on our visual system as much because we can we can rely on our, our somatosensory system, our proprioception, knowing where we are in space in relation to ourself. Um, and what I'm really interested in kind of understanding is um, some of the some of these changes in this intersection here between um, the somatosensory decline and the visual uptake uh, or reweighting, um, because that potentially is the 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 area. Um, or the time frame in which balance might be at, at its worst. Um, and we can do this by systematically challenging uh, different aspects of our balance system. So we can have participants stand on a firm surface with their eyes open. And in that case, they can utilize all aspects of their, of their balance um, system. We can have them close their eyes. So we're taking away the vision. We can have them stand on a foam pad 
so we can adjust their somatosensory feedback. Um, and when we look at the differences between middle-aged adults and older adults, we really don't see uh, significant changes or significant differences between um, those, those stance conditions where they're standing on a firm surface with their eyes open or their eyes closed. When we do start to see the, the differences are when we are challenging their somatosensory system. So um, as proprioception and the visual systems are, are, are systematically challenged, the balance becomes more challenging for older adults. And that's when, that's when we actually start to see the significant differences. Of course, we also see changes in walking. Um, and a lot of this research is really focused on, on the differences between young adults and older adults. And we see, you know, you know, stark contrast between, you know, these traditional spatial temporal measures like uh, gait speed and stride length. Uh, older adults demonstrate reductions in, in both of those. Uh, we see changes in variability, changes in asymmetry, and also in, in gait coordination. Um, so the accuracy and consistency of stepping over a bout of walking. But when we looked at the differences between middle-aged uh, adults and older adults, there was only a few variables that showed significance. In fact, when we were looking at 52 different uh, spatial temporal measures, only four of them demonstrated significance. Uh, one of them was uh, toe off angle, so the variability of your toe off angle specifically. And then the others were related to the range of, of motion of the trunk, which older adults demonstrate a significantly reduced range of motion at the trunk, um, which was interesting because, you know, conventionally we think of, uh, you know, older adults having a, a, a reduction in gait speed, and that's, of course, a hallmark of, of aging. But when we looked at these two different populations, that one wasn't one of the ones that popped up. And then when we looked at the measures and whether or not they were able to discriminate between middle-aged adults and older adults, um, so these, I'm gonna orient everybody to, to this graphic first, I guess. So this is a spider plot. And around the, um, the edge, can everybody see there? I'm gonna go like this. So these are um, AUC, values right here. So uh, a 0.8 would uh, indicate that there's excellent discriminatory ability between um, for a variable between the two groups. So that variable allows us to say, you know, performance in, in, of this would indicate that you're in this group. Performance of this would indicate that you're in that group, etc. cetera. Um, on the outside here, these are mean gate variables. So these are the specific mean gate variables right here. We have variability measures right here. And then we have 180 degree turn measures right here. And you're gonna see a, a number of these spider plots throughout and I'll, I'll remind everybody as we go. Um, but what we're seeing here, so these are the top 20 variables of those 52 um, that demonstrated the highest uh, uh, discriminatory ability. Uh, and between middle-aged adults and older adults, we're really not seeing what we would consider um, really strong strong or excellent discriminatory ability for any of the gate variables. Um, toe off angle and uh, 180 degree turn velocity are the ones that get the closest. And, you know, potentially it's just because, you know, when we walk in a straight line, you know, we're not challenging the, the system as much. And so it's a more of an automatic um, type of movement that isn't as um, disrupted uh, as a product of age. And while most walking research is focused on the, the straight ahead walking, of course, not all walking is straight. So um, this has led to a lot of my research which is focused on looking at and understanding turning. So turning is a ubiquitous movement. We do it 45% of all the steps we take on a daily basis incorporate some degree of a turn. Turning requires this whole body dynamic coordination. So uh, all levels of the nervous system must be engaged to be able to do it. And we know that falls while turning can increase the risk of a hip fracture by a factor of eight compared to a fall while walking straight ahead. And there's been a ton of research out there showing that turning changes with age as well. So we see increased number of steps to complete a turn. We see a longer turn duration and we see a reduced turn velocity um, in older adults. But, 
are any of these variables able to discriminate between uh, different groups of people? So when we look at younger adults versus middle-aged adults, turning really isn't, uh, it doesn't really tell us a whole lot. It doesn't have a whole lot of power in telling us, you know, which, which group someone may belong in. However, when we look at middle-aged versus older adults, um, the turning variables do tell us a lot. So they're both significantly different between younger and or middle-aged and older adults, but they also tell us, um, they can tell us quite a bit of, you know, what, what, what type of movement that individual is um, producing. Um, and then we can also look at transition. So the situation- I got my phone. Friends. You want to take the computer? Hey, Stephen, you're, uh, you Stephen, you're unmuted. Um, and so we can also look at the transition. So a sit to stand, for instance. So uh, the red on the outside, those are variables that demonstrate a significant difference between middle-aged and older adults. So duration of the sit to stand, the lean angle variability of the sit to stand, and the lean angle variability of the stand to sit movement. And while those variables were significantly different between the groups, they really weren't able to tell us a whole lot about whether or not an individual uh, belongs in, in one category or, or another. And so what I'm getting at here is, sure, it's really important to understand the significant differences of movement between different groups of people, but really understanding how are those movements or how are those measures um, able to discern more about that, um, that individual or that category can be just as helpful and informative. Along with understanding the, the degradation of movement or mobility disability, I'm, I'm interested in understanding the, the changes in, in, in the nervous system and how those relate to, to movement. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at neurophysiology. So we know that cortical inhibition, which is a measure of gamma immunobutyric acid or GABA, um, which is located in the, the motor cortex, um, is associated with um, the coordination of our upper extremities uh, to be able to complete tasks like buttoning our shirts, tying our shoes, et cetera, cutting an onion. Um, and we know that older adults who maintain better upper extremity uh, performance or coordination display higher levels of, of inhibition. And we can do, we can assess this using a number of different ways. For me, I use what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So if you're not familiar with TMS, I'm going to get you, give you the quick and dirty here. Uh, so TMS, the device is on the top right there. You use a coil that you can stimulate and it produces an electromagnetic stimulation. So a TMS stimulation results in a depolarization of local neurons. Um, that results in the action potential that travels down the cortical spinal tract to a muscle of interest that leads to the, the contraction of that muscle, um, which is known as a motor evoked potential. So that motor evoked potential <clears throat> can be seen right here in uh, terms of electromyography or EMG. So it literally looks like a twitch and that can be measured. But after that initial depolarization, it's followed by a large release of inhibition and that results in the cessation of muscle activity, which is here in red. Um, and that can be, that can be used to measure, uh, you know, relative amounts of, of inhibition or GABA. So the longer in duration the, the muscle is turned off, the more inhibition there is, the shorter in duration, the less inhibition there is. And so <clears throat> because there was uh, a lot of literature indicating that upper extremity coordination was associated with um, levels of inhibition between young and older adults, I was interested in doing this on the lower extremities. So I, I stimulated the, the lower extremities and then um, looked at the coordination of walking to see if there were associations. And so what we see here are the blue is younger adults, the, the orange there is older adults. We see that there's a, a significant association um, for the younger adults, indicating that those younger adults with less cortical spinal inhibition demonstrate better coordination. So a, a lower score for PCI is better coordination. And then for older adults, it's not a significant association, but it's trending in, in, a, in a way where those older adults with greater levels of inhibition demonstrate better gait coordination. When we look at a more dynamic movement, 
such as a 360 degree turn and specifically the turn duration, we see a significant association for younger adults and older adults. Same similar trend. So younger adults with less inhibition, cortical spinal inhibition demonstrate um, a shorter turn duration. And those older adults with greater cortical spinal inhibition demonstrate a shorter turn duration. And so we see that these there's these you know age related changes in, in uh, neurophysiology, but we also know that there's cognitive changes as well. So aging is associated with gradual decline in a bunch of different cognitive domains. And studies have shown that um, cognitive function is associated with straight ahead walking, um, which tells us that cognitive function is necessary for safe, effective, and independent movement. <clears throat> Again, I'll orient you to this graph here. So now we're going to eat these values on the what we might consider the y-axis are our regression values, so they're association values. Um, instead of AUC values. And then on the outer rim, we have the, the type of task that participants were asked to do, and then the metrics associated with that task, and then we can plot the data. So when we look at the associations between turning performance and cognitive function, for example, when we look at the um, cognitive performance of response inhibition, um, we can see that there's significant uh, associations uh, between the performance of response inhibition and the performance of, of turning. So for instance, response inhibition explains a significant proportion of the variance for normal pace, 180 degree and 360 degree um, turn duration and peak turn velocity, indicating that those older adults who have better um, performance in response inhibition tasks demonstrate what we would consider better you know, movement performance or turning performance. Similarly, we see that with attention as well. So the you know, a cognitive task assessing attention, we see that those older adults who perform better on, it, on the attention task demonstrate better turning performance as well. And lastly, we can look at you know, age-related cortical changes. So studies have, have demonstrated you know, strong associations between cortical atrophy um, and various domains of straight ahead walking, uh, indicating that it's not just the, uh, you know, the, the cerebellum or the motor cortex that are associated with how we, we walk um, and navigate the, the world around us. There's a bunch of different regions of the brain that are all interconnected and have interplay, allowing us to, to make these movements. So for instance, if we, if we put walking variables into say the, the rhythm domain, such as stride time, we can see the frontal cortex and the posterior parietal cortex are engaged. And if we look at you know a, a pace domain, such as gait speed, we can see that the frontal pull is uh, engaged as well. And so I, I wanted to look at turning because turning has kind of been put to the wayside in some of, some of the mobility research. Um, and I, I did this with a, a cohort of older adults looking at the, the frontal cortices to see if there were associations between cortical thickness and, and turning performance. And, you know, kind of not surprisingly, we did see some, some associations um, between, say, the frontal pull and steps in the turn, um, the, the caudal middle frontal area. So these are all areas that you can see that are highlighted by these stars here. Um, that are demonstrating uh, associations um, between the different turn variables and cortical thickness, such that those, um, those individuals who have um, maintained cortical thickness are demonstrating better turning performance. So to recap, we know that mobility is, is not only important, but it also demonstrates associations between cognitive function, prefrontal cortical thickness, and neurophysiological activity. And knowing that, can we proactively uh, attenuate mobility disability safely? Is there any way that we, we can do some, some preventative um, care here? And so this leads me to my PEPPER study. So the short name of my PEPPER study is the HOME study. Um, and it, the long name is the development of a home-based self-delivered prehabilitation intervention to proactively reduce fall risk in older adults. And we're doing this in individuals' homes, right? So we have to do this carefully and safely. And so we're using um, two different um, 
modes or methods, and I'm going to get into those right now. So one of those is uh, through the use of motor imagery. So motor imagery is is kind of a, a blanket term for both action observation and, and mental imagery. Action observation refers to observing uh, the optimal performance of a task and thinking about the specific motor strategies necessary for its completion. So it's watching, you know, somebody do the task correctly and thinking about how you could do it correctly as well without physical movement. And mental imagery refers to mentally rehearsing an action and its associated sensations without any physical movement. So now you're really just focused on thinking about how you could complete that task and all the various sensations and movements and strategies that you would need to do to be able to do that. And fortunately, you know, there's some neuroimaging studies that demonstrate activation overlap um, between action observation, mental imagery, and physical practice. And so when we look at this um, graphic here, we can see that there's regions of the brain that are that have overlap um, between you know, action and observation and mental imagery, but also when we physically practice that movement, indicating that theoretically, if, if we can practice in our mind without physically doing it, and it engages similar neural, um, neural structures or networks, maybe we can prime the nervous system to be able to adapt um, and perform better when we have to physically practice that. And we're also utilizing neuromodulation. So what is neuromodulation? The alteration of neural and synaptic properties by neurons themselves or substances released by neurons. And we do this using uh, really low intensity transcranial direct current stimulation. And what that does is it allows us to alter the resting membrane potential to either increase or decrease the likelihood that a neuron will fire. And so when paired with an activity, excitatory neuromodulation may uh, reinforce and enhance activity-dependent neuroplasticity. And so this is the, the montage that we use for, our, um, for my study. And it's the, we're targeting the, the frontal region of the brain. Um, and so the, the current density is really, if we look at this um, graphic down here below, you know, we're, we're able to stimulate the, the prefrontal executive function networks, but also the premotor networks as well. And then, you know, I'm interested in um, understanding both movement quantity. So individuals in this study wear a activity monitor for seven days pre and post intervention. Um, and that allows me to characterize, you know, how much are these individuals moving? How much time are they sedentary? Um, how much time do they stand? How many sit to stands do they have, right? So I can characterize these individuals to a degree, just when they live in their normal environment rather than when they put on a show and a performance when they come into the lab. But I also am incorporating um, a bunch of clinical assessments to assess movement quality. So these are all assessments that have very strong psychometric properties. Um, and they're all kind of under the umbrella of, of the, the mini best test that I've, I've augmented um, to incorporate some other um, tests as well. And then they go home and they do uh, a two week intervention. Because this is a, a pilot feasibility study, um, you know, we're really not uh, powered to, to look at uh, you know, significant differences in performing a bunch of inferential statistics to see what kind of changes we had. We're really interested in seeing, does this home-based intervention um, have, is it, is it accessible for folks? Um, and so participants are in this study are, are randomly assigned to either an active or a sham TDCS group. So some part, half of the participants are, are getting what we would consider real TDCS. The other half are getting um, fake TDCS, but both groups are doing the motor imagery intervention. And so what is that motor imagery intervention? So it's a YouTube channel that I learned how to make. I'm not a YouTuber, um, but participants are given this link and then they can, you know, follow all of these videos. And so over the course of the six sessions, they practice each of these videos. Um, and so they practice the timed up and go, the 360 degree turn task, balance imagery, et cetera. 
And what does one of these look like? So this is the timed up and go. And so what I do is I walk participants through um, what they what they should be focusing on and what they should be doing. Um, so participants spend time doing the action observation. So they watch uh, an individual do the task correctly. So this is for a timed up and go. So they're watching an individual perform the time up and go correctly. And I instruct them to pay attention to specific aspects of that individual's movement. They do that in both the first person and the third person perspective. After you know observing the individual do it, I ask them to then um, complete that task um, you know, using mental imagery. So they are, are now just focused on with their eyes open or closed, spending a couple of minutes imagining themselves complete the task and all of the feelings and sensations they would need to, to do in order to complete that task um, correctly and appropriately. And so this is the, the setup of the study and the aims of the study. So as the aim, first aim of this study is really establish feasibility and acceptability of delivering this telehealth-based motor imagery and TBCS intervention for improving mobility. Aim two is uh, determine the extent to which motor imagery and TBCS augment objective functional mobility outcomes. And aim three is determine the extent to which motor imagery and prefrontal TBCS influences physical activity outside of the lab and, of course, sedentary behavior. So we're we're nearing the, the end of this um, study. Uh, the original enrollment target was 30 individuals. We have a wait list right now, which is awesome. People are excited about this study. And so we just upped it to 34, um, but we have four actively enrolled and they'll be finished next week. Um, so we're actually closer to about 76% complete with the study. Um, we have a perfect split for sex. So 50% are male and 50% are female. We actually have a lot of couples that are really interested in, in doing this, um, which is kind of fun. We have an average age of 78, which is which is nice to see. And the criteria for you know being in the study is, of course, you can't have any contraindications to TDCS. So there's some some you know pharmaceutical that you know we don't allow, um, but we also are asking, we want participants for this study that um, have demonstrated a, a history of a fall, have recovered from a fall-related event, or <clears throat> have a fear of falling. And so all of the participants in this study um, have, have a check mark next to, to at least one of those. So the preliminary acceptability of this intervention is, is really compelling. Um, so if we look at these nine questions that I ask after the intervention, um, one of the first one is, it was easy to prepare the device and accessories for each session. The participants, you know, strongly agreed with that statement, um, or rather strongly agreed with that statement. The device was, uh, the device and setup was unnecessarily complex. They did not think so, luckily. Um, the device was easy to use. They agree with that. They felt that the videos and movements that I covered were helpful, which is which is nice to see. Um, they feel like most people would be able to do this um, this intervention. They didn't think it was cumbersome. Um, they felt confident using it once they got going. Um, and they, when you look at the effectiveness of treatment and whether or not they felt like it increased over the course of the intervention, um, surprisingly, they think it. they maybe agree, um, but of course they don't know, and I don't know what group they're in, but still it's, it's compelling. And then when we look at the preliminary results, so these participants are, are doing a full battery of cognitive um, assessments. Uh, we're seeing, so blue is pre-intervention, post is uh, the orange there. So when we look at response inhibition, we're seeing a, a increase in performance, so a, you know, a higher score is better here. Of course, these are just means, so I don't actually know if these are significant at all. Um, but at least we're trending in the in what we would consider the the right direction. We're also seeing an improvement in attention, verbal working memory and attention, visual spatial processing, visual spatial working memory, and then this is also another visual spatial working memory task 
um, but we're seeing kind of a, a reduction in performance, and I'm you know not sure uh, what that means yet. Um, this is all really hot off the press uh, data that we've put together. When we looked at the when we look at you know preliminary results for the mobility, so specifically for the timed up and go, um, on the left there, that's showing that's normal. Um, that's just at their normal, comfortable pace. Um, a faster time would equal better performance. We see that between pre and post intervention, uh, individuals are getting a little bit faster. And then when we have them do a dual task, um, for this case, it's a serial subtraction of sevens, um, which none of them enjoy. Uh, I don't either. But we also see a, a, a faster time pre and post on average. And then when we look at their static balance, so that spaghetti looking thing on the lower left, um, that is what we call a stabilogram. So orange is the post and the blue uh, spaghetti line is the pre. And with a tighter um, clump, that would indicate that their uh, postural stability is improving. Um, so you want that to, to not move very much. Uh, we, you wanna see a really tight, um, uh, stabilogram. And so with participants' eyes open on the firm surface, we see an improvement in postural stability in terms of past length, path length. And then when we have them close their eyes on a firm surface, we see a similar trend. So um, their their path length is, is reducing uh, after the, the intervention. And then, of course, this is all combined with the, the, the mini best test. Um, and so the mini best test is a uh, is uh, kind of an exam that is uh, split into four different domains, and it has a it can assess anticip uh, kind of anticipatory domain, a reactive postural control domain, uh, sensory orientation domain, and dynamic uh, gait domain. Um, and so you can kind of separate and see where improvements may be happening, or you know overall improvements. Um, just looking at the total score. Uh, so pre-intervention, we have a, an average of 21.8 out of, you know, 28 would be a, a perfect score on this exam. Um, and then post-intervention, we have an average of 24. And so we're seeing a, an improvement of 2.2 points, um, which uh, a clinically meaningful difference is, uh, I believe, a four, uh, a four-point change. Um, and so to see at all of an improvement in such a short um, window in terms of, a, of an intervention, I'm, I'm you know, excited to see that. But moving forward, what do we do with this, right? And so this is, of course, the state of Florida here. That orange um, star is Alachua County, where uh, University of Florida is. Um, and this is indicating uh, primary care shortage um, or, uh, with it, within the counties, right? So there's only one county in the state of Florida that has no uh, shortage of primary care. Um, the other ones have some degree of a shortage. So when we look at just the metro counties, there's 45% of metro counties that have some sort, some degree of a shortage of primary care services. But when we look at our rural communities, 95% of them um, have uh, a shortage in, in primary care. And so what do I mean by this? What, why is this important? And I think that uh, an intervention that allows for uh, a proactive approach and that doesn't require an individual to come into the clinic could potentially be a, a way to interact with, um, with people who, who live in counties or areas that have a reduction in primary care services or healthcare services in general. Um, and, you know, what do we need to do to advance care, um, in my opinion, right? And so I think one way that we can advance care is really through improving the accessibility of, of care. Um, my, you know, the, the research out there shows that combining motor and cognitive tasks um, can, can be really beneficial. And then, Lastly, is to intervene prior to an adverse event. Let's um, work on being proactive than reactive as a, as a healthcare community 
Um, and I think in some realms we can, in some spaces we can't, of course, um, but wherever we can, I think it's important that we try to take that uh, initiative because it, it can be um, massively beneficial on a lot of different fronts. Um, with that, of course, uh, I have to thank all of my mentors and collaborators and people that have <laughs> held my hand along the way. Of course, the, the research coordinators and interns that helped me collect all of this data. Um, without them, we couldn't do it. Uh, and then my funding sources and, of course, the Pepper Center, which has been super, super awesome. And with that, I'll take any, uh, any questions that people may, may have. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, let me see here if we have any questions. Uh, I see a lot of clapping hands, but not raised hands. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make a comment. This is Lou Lipsitz all the way in Boston. Yeah, hi. Thanks the for Boston Pepper Center. And as you probably know, um, Brad Manor and his team are part of our Pepper Center. And yeah. He's done a lot of work very similar to yours, um, but focusing primarily on the dual task cost. Uh, yeah. during gate. You know, when you do the serial subtractions, your gate slows and your balance is worse. And that seems to be a really good, first of all, risk factor for falls and also something very amenable to prefrontal uh, cortex um, transcranial uh, direct current stimulation. Yeah. So I wonder if, um, you know, you've done much work with that and maybe incorporating that executive control into your intervention might even make it um, more powerful. And maybe even with electrodes, not only in the motor cortex, but also in the frontal cortex might, um, might be beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, I mean, the Brett's doing some really great work. He, he actually gave a talk to, to us not long ago. Um, and I think it's super cool. Um, and I agree with you. I think engaging executive um, executive function and movement type of uh, um, uh, interventions is is kind of the way to go. I think that is really important. One of the things that I'm not able to tease out with this particular paradigm and intervention that I'm doing is, you know, I'm stimulating the frontal cortex, right? Am I only improving people's ability to to perform mental imagery, right? Or am I improving people's mobility, right? Um, because I'm, I'm targeting you know, the executive function networks. Um, and so that's one of the questions that I'm, I'm really interested in kind of probing down the road is, hey, when I when I give you, you know, this TVCS and you're, you're asked to, to imagine doing these tasks, which is really, you know, strongly associated with, I would, I would argue working memory, right? Um, are we enhancing your your overall working memory, right? Um, and so, well, that's measurable. I mean, I think that's yeah. great fodder for a future R O one. I mean, I think that's yeah. those questions can be answered. Yeah, I'm excited yeah. about that. Too. Other questions from the group? I would just ask this, being totally out of my area of expertise. How do the conversations go with research subjects when you describe transcranial stimulation? So <laughs> that's that's a great question. Um, so I the the oldest participant <clears throat> in the study is is over the age of ninety, um, and he came into the study and he was like, "I am pumped to get my brain stimulated," um, and I was just like, "You're awesome." First off, and right. um, but overall, everybody, you know, it's it's such a it's such a low level of stimulation, right? Um, that, that people get over it pretty quickly. Um, and it's, there's so much data out there, um, indicating that it's safe and feasible. And so you can really like fall back on that. Um, but overall, no one has been like hesitant of, of it. Um, in fact, they've kind of enjoyed it really, you know, it's, uh, yeah. No, I'm, just, I'm just wondering about that initial conversation yeah. where, or, and are you missing out on a lot of people because you know, they see a flyer or get a message from you yeah. for recruitment. They're like, no, thank you. I Keep mean, it's, po it's possible. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't know the people that are like, uh-uh, not, don't, I don't want my brain stimulated. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 
Peter McMenon and then do you have a uh, question or comment? I do. Thank you. Uh, Peter McManaman in Chicago at Northwestern University, a physical therapist. So fascinating talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. My question is, I guess, pretty simple, really. It seems like uh, there's a lot of evidence out there that the quality of the walking parameters that you went through uh, is an early indicator of declines in brain, both structure and function, it seems. My question is, is there any evidence that rigorous, I guess, or regular routine physical activity that emphasizes coordination, control, balance, things like Tai Chi, just rigor, just vigorous walking would uh, reduce the amount of brain uh, decline? Yeah. I think there's, I think you could take that a step further and, and say that it improves the, you know, neural structure and function. So there's some really great work, you know, out there, of course, in the stroke literature, but also in the, the aging literature that our nervous system's plastic and we can have improvements both from a, from a structural perspective and uh, a functional perspective um, if we were to engage in and say physical therapy, right? Uh, or targeted rehab programs, or even just quality of life adjustments, or, or just like, uh, not quality of life, but just changes in lifestyle adjustments, right? Um, where we can, we can see, you know, significant improvements in just neural efficiency. Um, so how are these various, you know, hubs within the brain communicating with each other? Um, but also in even in the the structure, the thickness of the brain um, being preserved. Yeah, absolutely. So in other words, it see even though the research really shows a strong association, it, it, that always raises the question of cause and effect. Yeah. What you're saying seems to suggest that insufficient physical activity is at least one of the causative factors behind brain. Uh, structure and function decline well i think you know that's a that's a that's a that's a big question right so that's i would say yes right so physical function over the course of our lifespan um if we were if we are to maintain that uh i think it would it would serve us well um compared to no physical function over the course of our lifespan however there's so many other factors that go into into it, right? Um, that that it's hard to categorize, just you know, or say that it's just physical function that's gonna you know help you maintain these you know this this neural capacity that that's beneficial. Um, I think it's absolutely one one component of it, and I think it's a very important component of it, and something that we have the ability to control, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think I mean, if anything, it's 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 better to be physically active than to be sedentary. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. There's another question in the chat from Anthony Gruber. Was there an, an analysis of the engagement metrics for the participants watching the YouTube videos? For example, how long did participants watch the video? Were they engaged? How often were the videos rewatched? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair question. So one thing I actually didn't think about, but learned is of course youtube collects all of the all of this information um and i could go back and see how long videos have been viewed and how many times they've been viewed and when they've been viewed um because i created this youtube channel uh and so i can i can see that the videos are being viewed at uh on average 90 percent of the the video is being viewed um which is great uh, it's better than, you know, the alternative. Um, and that the correct number of views ha has also been um, shown to, to be happening, right? So, uh, you know, people are, are actually watching these videos. And in fact, I had a participant who asked if they could continue watching the videos after the intervention, um, to which I said, of course, if you, if you would like to. Um, but yeah, so that's a that's a really fair question, I think. Moving forward into another, um, you know, larger study, that will be something that we'll have to figure out how to, you know, maybe better control for. 
know, Clayton, um, just to jump in, um, I know the time's running up, but, uh, you know, why I love the the work that you're doing in, in, in a lot, it's interesting, a lot of our work um, with our colleague uh, at uh, UT Southwest, Denise Park, who has done a lot of work in the space, but we use kind of the, the mental, uh, the cognitive re dress rehearsal, we call it, in terms of active imaging for actually promoting behaviors like medication adherence, which has actually been shown to have improvement. But the question I want to ask you is, you know, we're working with some some friends and colleagues at the Pitt Pepper Center, and I'm wondering, um, there's been some, we've been learning that there's, the World Health Organization has kind of, you know, trying to promote rehabilitation services uh, at new onset of a dementia or cognitive impairment. And I'm wondering, you know, how your work actually, I know you're thinking about prevention, which is great, but like, um, would you think of it, is there any clinical guidance as how what you're doing could actually help when you have these new diagnoses where they're kind of at risk for disability, but also, you know, there's still maybe some. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so I have a grant in right now in multiple sclerosis using this similar paradigm, because I think MS is one of the, the, you know, diseases where people live with that disease longer than they live without it. And it really affects their, their movement. Um, so for potentially newly diagnosed folks with MS or people experiencing um, disability, that might be a good, uh, this might be helpful. Um, but I'm also planning on, on putting together a, a small feasibility, you know, study like an R21 or something um, in the mild cognitive impairment realm. Um, so those, just like you're saying, the newly diagnosed or the folks that are, are showing some sort of uh, cognitive impairment, you know, um, uh, I think I, I agree. I think that that space um, could could use something like this, where they have to engage um, their mind and body simultaneously. Um, I think that is a, a really strong um, population that could benefit from something like this. Um, I, I, I love that you were thinking that because it makes me feel smart. Good luck on the R1. Awesome. Oh, it's not gonna be an R1, it's gonna be R21, but. Oh, I thought you had a switch that already. No, I wish, I'm not there yet. Any last questions or comments? Well, thank you very much, Clayton, for your presentation. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll hope to see you next month at our next pep around and uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you all. Again. Take care. Everyone. Take care.